This is Steve Zeltzer with Work Week in Pacifica, and today we're going to be talking about a very important struggle going on in Argentina. There is a new president, Javier Malay, who was elected with a demand for a radical restructuring of Argentina, uh, attacking uh, social benefits, social conditions, privatizing everything, and also he has threatened to destroy the trade union movement and attack the left. And there have been uh, protests already. Uh, in Argentina, of tens of thousands of workers throughout the country, of people, and the growing movement in Argentina against his draconian agenda may mean that he may be pushed out. And joining us is Ricardo Ortiz. He's a labor researcher, an expert on what's going on in Argentina, and has been following it quite closely. So welcome to our show, Ricardo. Thank you, uh, Steve, and everybody that is watching us. So, Ricardo, first of all, the economic crisis in Argentina is not new. It's been going on for a long time. And in the past, uh, presidents who have tried to impose uh, economic attacks have actually had to leave the country in helicopters. Absolutely right. Uh, In 2001, uh, President Fernando de la Rua had to be rescued out of uh, La Casa Rosada, which is the equivalent of the White House in the United States, by a helicopter due to the massive protests that uh, took place. So, I mean, the, that shows the combative capacity of the Argentinian working class. And uh, Javier Malay is quite a character. Uh, he has cloned dogs. He says he takes advice from his dogs. Uh, he seems to be pretty arrogant. He's never had a position. He's a professor. Uh, how did he end up as president of Argentina? Well, it, it is a funny story, and uh, it has some sides that people do not know. Uh, he uh, was uh, a professor of uh, economics at a uh, different uh, Argentinian uh, higher education institutes, but also uh, he was a f- financial advisor to uh, Corporación America, which is one of the largest conglomerates uh, of uh, uh, communications and uh, infrastructure in Argentina. Actually, the owner of uh, Corporación América is Eduardo Urascain, which is the fifth uh, most wealthy person in Argentina. So uh, that's where he comes from. I mean, all this talk that uh, he has attributed himself to be a guy that has no connections with the so-called political caste is a complete lie. Uh, Actually, during the presidential debate, uh, uh, his uh, uh, opponent, Sergio Massa, brought out a point that I mean, Lay got very nervous. He said, oh, remember, uh, Javier, we used to be friends when you were an, working as an, economist, as an economist. You used to come to my office. What has happened? And uh, Javier Milei uh, uh, couldn't deny that fact. Also, Javier Milei spent a tenure we, as uh, working for Domingo Cavallo, which uh, was the architect of privatization of the Argentinian economy during uh, the tenure of Governor Carlos Menem, who uh, did a lot of privatization and a big economic chaos in Argentina. That's where he comes from. And the United States, of course, has a big role, has had a big role in Argentina. In 1976, they supported a military coup. Why did the United States do a military coup in in Argentina? What was the result? Well, uh, they did perform a military coup due to the fact that uh, the you know the rule of the capitalist class, uh, the Argentinian local bourgeoisie, and the American uh, influence was very questioned by uh, youth movements, uh, labor organizations, and actually before the coup in 1976. There were already happening some worker strikes, uh, and uh, you know the government had a crush uh, insurgent youth military leftist uh, movements, but the working class was rising in strikes. So uh, in '76, uh, they supported uh, the coup against uh, the government of uh, 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 Maria uh, Perón which was the second uh, wife of uh, General Perón. 
And was the AFL-CIO involved in that coup? Yes, <laughs> they, they supported, you know, uh, and did not oppose. They knew, you know, about it. And there are plenty of documentation of that. Uh, we can refer that to uh, the National Archives, where there are uh, documents not too long ago declassified showing the role of the United States and uh, uh, other institutions in the United States, such as uh, the FL-CIO. Uh, and what happened after that coup, there were uh, raids of uh, on plants, Ford plants, General Motors plants, workers were kidnapped. Uh, a lot of uh, workers lost their lives and, and their families were harmed. What, what was the result of that coup? Oh, definitely. I mean, uh, there were people that were tortured uh, at a Mercedes. Uh, there is a documentary uh, it's on YouTube that talks about uh, how people, you know, workers were tortured in a Mercedes-Benz plants in, in, in Argentina and in also in another in other uh, uh, factory uh, uh, plants uh, by owned by Ford and other multinational corporations. If the victims under the coup are, you know, estimated at 30,000 uh, dead or missing, you know, uh, kidnapped by uh, the junta. And uh, these are numbers that uh, the, the archives of the armed forces have shown. There were more, uh, there were approximately 800 centers of torture. Uh, you can imagine the amount of people that went in uh, through these centers. And uh, people were, you know, in, like in the case of uh, some nuns, they were launched into the sea by uh, uh, the Argentinian Navy uh, airplanes. And there is also the case of the Nobel family where children were kidnapped from their parents before they were murdered and then given to uh, capitals, given to families there. Is that the case? And, and what resulted in that? Oh, I mean, uh, that is absolutely the case. And uh, there is now, uh, uh, due to the activism of uh, mothers and grandmothers, the movement called, being called the uh, uh, Movimiento de las Madres de, de Mayo, uh, de la Plaza de Mayo and the Abuelas of the Plaza de Mayo, a lot of uh, children have been identified through uh, DNA uh, testing. There were uh, volunteers, anthropological uh, forensic teams that uh, you know were based in the United States and they collaborated with activists and doctors in Argentina to identify uh, pe you know uh, people that were found in a uh, uh, common. Uh, tombs that were, you know, the military killed. And has the United States or the AFL-CIO ever apologized to the people and workers of uh, Argentina? Not at all, <laughs> as far as uh, I know. Uh, yes, I mean, the Junta was uh, financed, uh, uh, trained and equipped by uh, the United States and also were involved uh, some uh, French military advisors, uh, one of them being uh, uh, Paula Suceres, which uh, he, in his memoir, said that uh, he trained American troops at Fort Bragg also, you know, so this was a complete, uh, you know, international uh, uh, cooperation in the murdering. Plus, Argentina was also a plan of the repressive uh, trans-Latin uh, American countries, U.S. engineer plan called Plan Condor, which uh, was uh, like a united front of... Uh, the military dictatorships of Argentina, Chile, uh, Brazil, uh, Paraguay, and, uh, and Bolivia, uh, you know, that they coordinated, they gave information across borders about activists and uh, people that were su suspected of being uh, so-called subversives. And the movement in uh, Argentina, there's been a long a history of Peronism, Juan Peron, um, and that has influence in the working class. In uh, what was, uh, who was Juan Peron, and this movement that he had in the working class Peronism? What is that uh, really about? Peron was uh, Juan Domingo Peron was a member of the Argentinian Armed Forces. That uh, at one point, when he was a young officer, he spent time in in, in Mussolini's uh, Italy. Uh, as a as an student, as a military student, and he was influenced for what he saw uh, as the economic model of uh, you know Mussolini fascism. 
he can he comes from to Argentina you know he go moves up to the ranks and then uh, you know he becomes a uh, part of the ruling uh, military elite in Argentina then uh, he becomes the minister of uh, uh, labor and social works and uh, he uh, becomes popular with the population because uh, he introduces uh, some measures that uh, will uh, more or less count down the uprising of workers in Argentina. It's still a military uh, government, you know, a dictatorship. And then uh, uh, he is imprisoned by one wing of the military. He goes to elections. Uh, he's opposed by the American ambassador because they see him probably as, uh, you know, somebody that they could not control. And, uh, you know, uh, he is pragmatic. He implements uh, measures of pseudo-democracy with, you know, uh, popul right-wing populism. Uh, he, you know, in order to contain the combative spirit of the Argentinian uh, masses, he introduces some uh, Keynesian uh, economy measures to uh, contain. He gives some crumbs. Uh, due to the fact, you know, people have to know that Argentina uh, is a pioneer in terms of the working class. The first a socialist party that from Latin America that was admitted to the second to the third international was uh, uh, the Argentinian, uh, which became the Communist Party. You know that shows the combativeness uh, and the resilience of the Argentinian working class from very early on. And this Peronist movement, uh, they have led the unions in Argentina. And uh, they, uh, at the same time, uh, they have gone along with the IMF policies in, in uh, Argentina. So why don't you talk about the economic development and the role of the Peronist movement in Argentina? Definitely, uh, you know, uh, I forgot to say, I'm going to just say briefly, uh, Peron became very uh, famous because he was opposed by the American ambassador an entrepreneur uh, with a last name Braden. So uh, in 1946, 47, he won the elections based on economic nationalism and right-wing populism. But then uh, he was uh, uh, deposed by a coup. And then, you know, throughout the, 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 the decades, the Peronist movement have evolved as a pragmatic that adapts to, uh, you know, uh, the circumstances. In '73, when he was uh, when he returned from exile in from Spain, uh, he got elected president, and uh, he even was opposed by young people that uh, supported him. So his minister, uh, there, there was this person, the a policeman, Jose Lopez Rega, who. Uh, uh, Organized an organization called La Alianza, uh, Anticom Alianza Anticomunista de Argentina, which was, uh, you know, an ultra right fascistic uh, squad that uh, kidnapped people, murdered people that were activists. So moving forward, because, you know, I know we are constrained in time and uh, we cannot uh, tell, tell a whole course on Argentinian history. But then, you know, through... Uh, the 80s and 90s, when the, the so-called democracy uh, came to Argentina after the Malvinas War, uh, the Peronists uh, were able to be elected in the second civilian government by this figure, Carlos Menem. And he came with a neoliberal program. He, not, he uh, privatized uh, a lot of sectors of the uh, economy. And then the Peronis, you know, uh, trade unionists, they control the largest uh, trade unionist uh, workers' federation, which is called La Confederación General de Trabajadores, the General Confederation, Cent Central Confederation of uh, Workers, the CGT, CGT. And uh, they have co-opted the labor movement. And during the Menem years, they made deals with uh, uh, Carlos Menem. Uh, neoliberal, uh, you know, they barely oppose him. And uh, then through uh, the 2000s, uh, when uh, there were the election of uh, the so-called Kirchnerista governments uh, led by uh, uh, Nestor Kirchner, 
uh, former governor of the province of Santa Cruz, and then his wife, Cristina uh, Fernandez de Kirchner, they barely oppose, you know, uh, any measure that uh, those governments uh, uh, launch. I mean, during the, the so-called uh, leftist, which she was not, a tenure of uh, Cristina Fernandez, uh, she, con she made large amounts of uh, payments to the IMF. She's proud that uh, her husband uh, got the IMF to make uh, loans to the Argentinian government. Uh, they did fracking. They did uh, every reactionary uh, move against the working class, while at the same time uh, conceding some crops in some social services uh, programs. But the, unfortunately, in the Republic of Argentina, uh, the labor movement is pretty much uh, attached to uh, the Peronist uh, movement, the Partido Justicialista, and the coalitions that these uh, party forms. Uh, I just want to say that uh, the pe after the Kirchner's were out of power, then came this uh, neoliberal governor led by uh, a, a former president called Mauricio Macri, which is an advisor to uh, Millet at this moment. And some of his cabinet members are now working with Javier Millet. So uh, the Peronis, they made some opposition to Macri, but after he was defeated, uh, by uh, the former president that was into that was in office until three weeks ago, two weeks ago, three or two or three weeks ago, they barely did anything in four years, and I'm being uh, generous, <laughs> saying barely did anything. They never mobilized. Uh, there has been practically six years without a general strike in the republic. So, and one of the things that is uh, important about uh, Argentina is a mobilization of uh, the poor people, uh, Polio Obrero, uh, immigrants and others uh, fighting for food. Uh, how have the working class organized and the oppressed organized in, Puerto in uh, Argentina? Well, I mean, uh, in the words of uh, uh, the former ministry, uh, Minister of Security, Patricia Woolrich, and uh, the uh, uh, newspaper that is not uh, or a newspaper and conglomerate that are not certainly friends of uh, the working class, La Nación, more than 10,000 uh, pickets had this uh, year that uh, is exiting. I mean, uh, it's a complete movement of uh, organizations of the unemployed, of uh, poor people. Uh, also people that uh, belong to uh, certain uh, oppressed identities. And also there is a current called uh, Sindicalismo Combativo, Combative Trade Unionism, that uh, gathers some uh, caucuses within the unions and some unions, particularly uh, uh, SUBNA, which uh, uh, organizes in the multinational corporation Bridgestone. In the rail workers, uh, there is... Uh, a trade union leader that is very prominent, that is a, a socialist, uh, Mr. Sombrero, uh, Campero. Uh, so, uh, uh, and uh, in other sectors, you know, uh, of this uh, uh, United Front, they have been uh, participants and organizers of uh, these uh, rallies. In 2001, these piqueteros uh, formed a national uh, movement that occupy factories and uh, were the ones that kicked out uh, uh, Mr. Rua out of the country, he had to be saved by helicopter. So uh, I just wanna, now that you bring uh, this point, I just wanna say that uh, on the 20th of uh, this uh, month, just uh, barely six days ago, uh, Piquetero organizations led mostly by uh, El Polo Obrero and supported by the a left front of workers unity frente de izquierda de los trabajadores unidad they call for a, a national a, a actions a, a rallies and mobilizations in the principal cities of the country so uh, the ministry of security along with the president they came with this so-called uh, protocol of security 
which uh, it was a decree that uh, would prohibit people from uh, marching to the uh, streets, avenues. They could not, according to the decree, uh, uh, stop traffic, uh, block uh, bridges. And uh, uh, these people challenge that decree. And, uh, you know, one of the orders that the Ministry of Security said openly is, I want these people, if they do, are able to march, to do it to the, uh, through the sidewalk. Uh, but people were able to rally uh, to the streets. Probably they were around, you know, a few tens of thousands of people. And then uh, uh, the arrogance of this Ministry of Security may, you know, she uh, at 6 p.m. Uh, proclaimed victory uh, on national TV. And then at uh, 9 uh, p.m., the president of Argentina, uh, Mr. Millet, comes out publicly uh, on a speech announcing a 300 uh, decrees and pieces of legislation to uh, establish what he has called shock therapy. Uh, and then three hours after, multitudes of people came to uh, the Plaza de Mayo. They were able to rally, to demonstrate. They were interviewed on national TV. I mean, uh, and these demonstrations were did happen in uh, uh, Rosario and in Cordoba, which are very big cities and, uh, you know, important centers of... Uh, uh, important economic base in Argentina. And Malay, I saw him in the control room, police control room, watching the screen and and leading the, the, the police there. Uh, they weren't successful, uh, but he has also said that he wants to stop communism and also that uh, he's going to stop the Chinese from doing any trade uh, with Argentina. Now, Argentina is a major supplier uh, in China of, of wheat, of other materials. There's lithium there. Uh, what has uh, uh, Malay done in relationship to the Chinese, and, and what's happening in relationship to Chinese investment in Argentina? Well, uh, he has had, an, <laughs> it's interesting that question, because uh, he has uh, taken an ambivalent position about it. Uh, first, Xi Jinping sent greetings uh, to uh, uh, Javier Milei. He congratulated Javier Milei. Then the day after, the Chinese ambassador uh, came to visit Diana uh, Moldino, which is the, mini uh, the foreign ministry of the republic, and uh, uh, sent uh, a letter personally to uh, you know uh, the Malay government. So uh, you know Malay said, well, uh, you know, and his uh, spokesperson said that, uh, well, you know, we can continue having uh, economic relations. But the problem is right now that uh, during the previous press government, the Chinese opened a SWIFT account with the Argentinian government. And uh, they are, this Millet now is trying to rescind of that. But he has a problem because uh, there are sectors of the Argentinian capitalist class that they do trade with the Chinese, uh, you know, like in those uh, aspects that you mentioned. So, uh, if he really blocks uh, China from uh, trading for, with Argentina, it would be some sort of uh, a consequence in terms of uh, the economy of Argentina. And Malay has gotten some support in the United States. Uh, he likes uh, Donald Trump. Uh, he's visited. I mean, Bannon has probably been there. Um, is he part of an international movement uh, of the right wing in, globally? Yes, uh, actually, uh, a there is a right-wing party based in Spain called uh, Vox. You know, there are four, you know, uh, people that praise Franco, praise the monarchy, uh, say that uh, if you are a social democrat that equals communism, any intervention of the state in the economy equals uh, communism. Well, I mean, Trump calls communists the Democratic Party leaders. I mean, uh, Obama was a communist and a Muslim. Uh, I mean, these people are called communists. Yes. So uh, 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 the Vox Party initiated this movement with a document called La Carta de Madrid, which uh, they uh, made this uh, proclamation that they internationally are going to fight communism. So uh, one of the signers is uh, Javier Milei and many other right-wing uh, figures from Latin America. He has uh, said that uh, he... Uh, 
admires uh, uh, Margaret Thatcher, uh, Ronald Reagan, uh, Donald Trump, and uh, also his neighbor, uh, uh, the former president of uh, uh, Brazil, uh, Bolsonaro. Uh, Jair Bolsonaro. Yes, uh, he admires uh, the right wing. But let me say a couple of things about that. Uh, he even has people on his cabinet and around him that are even more right wing than he is. Uh, his vice president, uh, Miss Victoria Villarreal, she uh, is uh, the daughter of a former uh, military officer uh, of the Argentinian Republic, of the, of the Junta. And uh, she has uh, uh, been as an advocate in the past of the former president of Argentina during the Junta, the criminal Jorge Rafael Videla. She visited Videla in prison, assisted him, and then she came to the United States uh, to participate in a course supposedly anti-terrorism at the National Defense University in uh, uh, Washington, D.C. Uh, one of his closest buddies uh, is uh, Ramiro Marra, which is a, a, a tech investment capitalist. And he uh, has tried to organize what he called the anti-piqueteros, the anti-piqueteers. Uh, uh, so, I mean, and uh, actually the what would be the equivalent of the a White House counsel, Mr. Parra, is a guy that he admitted publicly that he was a Nazi in his youth, and he had to resign a, a post in the in the a, a, a National Attorney General's office because he was exposed as a Nazi, and his uh, apologies, if you know, and I'm quoting his words: "If I was a Nazi, I apologize." I mean. If I was, could you believe that? So, I mean, this is a, a government that uh, is, uh, you know, uh, composed, made of uh, some characters that are very uh, authoritarian, very repressive, that say, as you mentioned, that they are anti-communism, that are socialism, was installed by the previous government and they are dismas dismantling that, you know. Uh, I want to say something before I we jump into the other question. Actually, the Ministry of Security of the Republic, uh, Mrs. Uh, 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 all of a sudden I forgot her name, Patricia Bullrich. Uh, she's married to uh, a notorious a sinister character, uh, Guillermo Yanko, who is an arms lobbyist and a multimillionaire, and uh, he's close friends uh, with uh, the Israeli Prime Minister Guillermo Yanko. So uh, whenever uh, Netanyahu visits Argentina, this is the guy that is like uh, his representative in Argentina. And, uh, you know, Mrs. Bullrich uh, has said, in this government, we're going to go through all the way stopping these uh, uh, protests, these uh, strikes, because, uh, you know, when I previously was uh, heading the Ministry of Security, I couldn't, I was not allowed to go all the way. But this time, we're going all the way. The Menem government, the, uh, the Peronist movement, uh, actually did not take uh, Malay seriously. Um, and he didn't have a, a large movement, but he was helped. Was he helped electorally in getting into power in, in Argentina? Well, he was in, in many ways. Uh, for example, uh, since he is flamboyant, he used to be invited to uh, uh, these uh, uh, TV programs, first as an economic commentator, but then as uh, when he showed that an heroic side, and uh, he uh, on live TV would insult people, calling them communists, calling them ignorance. Uh, it happened like uh, uh, the Trump phenomena in this uh, United States. <laughs> uh, it became a personality, it, a national personality. A national personality. Plus, remember that I mentioned Corporación America, 
That is a conglomerate that also includes a communications enterprise, enterprises. So that sector starts supporting him and give him an audience. And then all the Argent most, not all, but most of the Argentinian TV stations and radio stations start inviting him, they start giving him a platform. So, uh, well, you know, uh, they help him. And you have said that he's crazier than Trump. He has some clone dogs that he says are his advisors. He is quite a character. He's quite a character. <laughs> he was asked recently in a TV program, one of the most, uh, most uh, TV programs in Argentina, whether if he was true that he consulted his dogs. And he did not give a definite answer. But uh, uh, he definitely, he did uh, send uh, his uh, dog Conan to be cloned. And uh, uh, so the dogs that he has have uh, names of a neoliberal economist, as for example, Milton, for Milton Friedman. <laughs> Carr for, <laughs> you know, <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, he is definitely uh, a, a person that is uh, unstable. Uh, he called the Pope a communist at one point. Uh, he, uh, uh, you know, has uh, a called uh, a TV uh, host that are just, uh, you know, uh, regular people, uh, dumb donkeys. I mean, he's a neurotic uh, character. And one manifestation of that is that uh, after these rallies took place uh, during this uh, past week, he was asked by uh, the press, what do you think about these rallies that happened? And uh, first he denied that I, the rally on the 20th was successful. And then about the uh, multitudinarian uh, rallies that took place uh, on uh, Thursday and Friday, he dismisses. He dismissed them as, well, the, uh, those people have uh, uh, are suffering of a Stockholm syndrome, and uh, people like that are people that are now are missing communism in Eastern Europe. Uh, there are people like that. So those are the those people. And what was the reaction in Argentina to that? Oh, people are, are incensed. Are feel very offended. People are really angry about that. Uh, to the point that uh, on uh, tomorrow, the twenty seventh, because of all these decrees that are calling for privatization of uh, state uh, companies, he eliminated out of uh, eighteen to twenty ministries. He eliminated half of the of the ministries. He has eliminated subsidies for transportation for people. He has uh, uh, he wants to eliminate unemployment uh, as is known right now. He wants for the you know the workers that uh, only they can be uh, they could be paid unemployment benefits if a collective bargaining co a contract states such a matter. If it is not in a collective bargaining, well, you know, good luck. Uh, make it on your own. So uh, uh, people have decided, so much the attacks has been that the CGT, which uh, did nothing in the last four years, they call for a march and ra massive ra march and rally are inv inviting other labor organizations to uh, demonstrate and challenge the the protocol of security tomorrow, tomorrow. And there was a left united front uh, in Argentina. Why don't you talk about that? Because its candidate, uh, this lawyer, uh, human rights lawyer Breck, Breckman, uh, was was the candidate. Uh, how did that come about? What is it, and what is his political role in in Argentina? Oh, definitely. Uh, the, her and uh, some other persons that should be mentioned uh, during this interview. Uh, these organizations, uh, they came to an agreement that uh, due to the urgency uh, of the economic and political situation in Argentina, they should stop uh, playing as uh, sectarian politics and they should, you know, try to join forces to uh, through the United Front 
uh, fight back against uh, government attacks. So uh, uh, the FITU is uh, made, uh, is, is composed of uh, the Socialist Movement of Workers, the MST, the uh, uh, Party of uh, Socialist Workers, the PTS, the Partido Obrero, the Workers' Party, and uh, uh, you, you, uh, a, le a Socialist Left, Izquierda Socialista. So they agreed to do an electoral united front and also to, uh, you know, join forces as much as they could in most of the points that they would agree to rally against the government. So uh, in the past, uh, the, the formation took place uh, more or less like a decade and it has continued uh, growing and uh, uh, gaining more popularity. You mentioned one uh, foremost uh, person, uh, Miriam Bregman. She's from the PTS. She uh, uh, is a lawyer and uh, she is a member of the Argentinian parliament. Uh, the left front of workers' unity, they do have a whole parliamentary block made of five uh, uh, parliament members. And also is, uh, and she, you know, she was involved in the uh, pro-abortion rights, but not only her, you know, uh, and other, there are other people that uh, belong to the Partido Obrero that are uh, foremost uh, uh, personalities like uh, Miss uh, Romina Pla uh, is also a teacher that she had been active in uh, the teachers uh, trade union movement. Uh, very active in the fight for labor rights, uh, for uh, women rights. So, uh, and you know, I'm, I'm from other organizations. There is a Mr. Gabriel Solano from the Partido Obrero, who is now a member of the Argentina, of the Buenos Aires City Council. He has presented many pieces of legislation to defend uh, workers. And they are not just legislators. These people are activists. You see them in rallies. You see them in marches. These people are not like, uh, you know, Bernie Sanders or uh, Ocasio-Cortez that are just uh, parliamentarians that do not really serve the people. These people are with the workers, have uh, been uh, successfully uh, uh, partic participated in a fight back against uh, the ruling class. Now, the rise of uh, fascist movements, right-wing fascist movements, um, is growing. Um, and in the United States, MSNBC, there's a section of the capitalist class uh, that is talking about a fascist coming to power. If Trump comes back, he's going to implement fascist policies. Um, most of the left in the United States is not really uh, united around any kind of united front. Uh, why is this united front taking place in Argentina and not in the United States? Well, in Argentina, first of all, the this uh, sector of the left, because it's not, let me clarify something. There are sectors of the left that uh, they did support the Peronis, like the Argentinian Communist Party, like the Maoist uh, uh, Revolutionary Communist Party of Argentina. They did support the Peronis government. On what basis do they support that government? Well, because according to them, uh, you, it was a democratic, uh, anti-imperialist, nationalist uh, government, you know, so uh, it needed to be supported while the government was uh, taking loans from the IMF, were <laughs> repressing people in the streets. But I'm talking, the, the, this uh, left that we're talking is an independent left, the left, front, the left United Front of Workers. It's an independent uh, Marxist left that does not compromise with the government. And they came to do that because they realized, look, we, are, we have been fighting each other. Why don't we uh, uh, collaborate more with each other? You know, uh, we are being killed. Uh, 40, you know, the, their estimates that from 42 to 50% of uh, the Argentinian people are poor. So, you know, we all are getting killed right here, are losing uh, ground. So we should, you know, try to uh, uh, be more united and collaborate uh, with our differences as much as uh, we can. And that has been successful, apparently. 
I think uh, certain, uh, well, I'm for certain uh, convinced that he has uh, a lot of success. And this uh, front actually uh, took up the challenge of M the Malay government, who said you can't march, you can't rally. They actually organized a, a march rally all over the country, and they were in the front page of the New York Times, a picture of their rally. Uh, and uh, Malay wants to crush them and uh, uh, physically exterminate them. Uh, that's what they've said that they want to do. Uh, what is the status of the unions? Because the unions in Argentina are, are quite powerful. And they, as you say, that they haven't been mobilizing. There haven't been any general strikes. Do you, you think the coming period is one of, of the working class as a whole coming into action? I think so, because, uh, I, well, <laughs> The Peronis uh, CGT didn't do anything in the last, uh, you know, six years. Uh, and made, you know, practically nothing, zero in the last four years against the Peronis government. And now they're being forced to fight. Uh, you know, uh, they are calling for a march with all, you know, workers' organizations that want to demonstrate a... Uh, the city, there are a couple of other uh, uh, central uh, confederations of labor that are more to the left than the CGT, the CTA. Uh, and uh, they are saying that they are also mobilizing. Actually, last Friday, the uh, state workers that are organized in uh, the ATE, Asociación de Trabajadores del Estado, uh, Association of State Workers, they did uh, some rally that, uh, you know, it was not as combative as it, as it was, but they did. And uh, they were awakened by the fact that the Millet government sent uh, police to some of their union offices. And there is uh, there are photos on the Internet. There is a videotape. So, you know, these people that uh, were, you know, quite passive now are waking up. And not only organized labor. People are being interviewed in the streets. People that voted for Millet himself because they thought that he was going to bring change, that he was going to be be, uh, be different. And uh, now they're saying, you know, that uh, that's not what they voted for, that they don't agree with all these uh, austerity measures. Okay. And the inflation in Argentina and uh, price increases is uh, driving people to the wall. Uh, what, I mean, the question of survival for a large number of people, is that on the agenda in, in Argentina? Definitely. I mean, Argentina has one of the highest inflation levels in the world. Uh, uh, last time, uh, a few days ago, it was in almost 150 uh, points in, in inflation, which is, a, you know, a tragedy. And uh, people are, you know, saying that they cannot uh, buy enough food, that uh, if they uh, pay for transportation, they, you know, lack money for uh, other necessities. Uh, you know, people are all the way tired and sick of uh, their economic situation. And Argentina is a rich country. Tremendous wealth, agriculture wealth, mining, big uh, industry. Uh, mm -hmm. Apparently, the uh, the capitalists wanted, and the IMF wants that money. Oh, definitely. I, even uh, Millet said that Elon Musk uh, called him the, a couple of days ago uh, to let him know that he wants to invest in Argentina. You know, uh, there is now uh, new deposits of uh, oil that were discovered in a region in the province of uh, Neuquén. Uh, they call it the uh, uh, Vaca Muerta, the dead cow, that are, they found w uh, one of the most, uh, one of the biggest deposits of oil of South America. Plus in the northern part of the country, there is uh, lithium and uh, uh, Laura Richardson, which is the head of the United States Southern Command uh, made a visit, uh, to, made to, has made two visits these years to Argentina in, in this uh, 2023. And uh, she has stated that, uh, you know, the uh, capacity and the deposits of this uh, lithium 
are so important that uh, you know the United States has to uh, keep an eye uh, on these uh, resources uh, to prevent supposedly other powers, you know, uh, from exploiting them. And the situation uh, is explosive. It's growing. Opposition is growing in the working class. Um, are workers in Argentina prepared uh, for the Malay government? And what will be the result if he is uh, forced to leave by helicopter? <laughs> well, I uh, certainly know a couple of things. Uh, there is a lot of conscientiousness and a lot of anger. And uh, even people that are like uh, the union bureaucrats that were not ready to fight, they are now saying that they are going to uh, oppose this. He made fun of them, didn't he? Uh, saying yes. that they weren't yes. really anything. Yes. Uh, actually, yeah. On Saturday, uh, Milei and his uh, security uh, uh, minister, she said that in the you know uh, the, these people are inconformists. In the last years, they haven't done anything, uh, but you know the majority of the people of the working class is not organized. Uh, most people that work for you know uh, on their own or work without being organized. So uh, uh, she made a challenge. She made fun of the uh, unions. So uh, now this is making people angry. Uh, even the, 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 the bureaucrats that have been, you know, more or less uh, sleeping like, a, a, like Cinderella, like the, you know, Cinderella. <laughs> now now uh, uh, they're saying that, uh, you know, they want to fight, that they're not going to allow this to happen. That is yet to be seen, you know, because uh, one characteristic that the trade union bureaucracy has is that sometimes or, well, commonly, they act like a, what one political uh, philosophy said, like a middle caste. So to, you know, more or less mediate between the working class and the capitalists. But the anger that is being shown in the streets and people manifest this in interviews uh, is too much. And uh, I think that through this process, people will be awakening and certainly the more to the le more the most leftist sector of the working class uh, which is a very uh, educated uh, sophisticated working class will start studying or realizing that we have to organize in different ways uh, and at a television program national television program uh, malay was asked by uh, the host uh, whether he was worried about a civil war in argentina and yes, he was asked. And he said, no, no, I'm not. <laughs> he, he said that he was not. And, uh, you know, don't worry about it. And then uh, uh, Patricia Woolrich, the Minister of Security, uh, she said, oh, don't worry about it because it's only 40,000 people that are against the government versus the rest of the 40 million Argentinians. So uh, you don't have to worry about that. And the possibility of a civil war in the United States, the right wing uh, forces, fascists, have been saying we're going to go into a civil war in this country. Uh, we're getting ready for a civil war. Um, is that the same kind of attitude that the right wing in Argentina has? Well, uh, they definitely do not respect, you know, uh, the labor movement. I should I should mention that uh, after. The rally on the 20th, the massive march and concentration, uh, Millet's government announced that uh, he's fining some of the organizing organizations that participated in the, in the march. Uh, one of the organizations was uh, fined with a $78,000 fine. And uh, on Saturday... Millet said that the whole cost of this uh, demonstration was 60 million pesos. And uh, the organizers will have to pay for the use of police and all that. The organizers of this uh, rally and march said, we are not going to pay that. Forget about it. You can say whatever you want to say. We're not, you know, paying that uh, fee, that, you know, a fine. And the debate in the United States now uh, of those uh, sections of capital who are concerned about Trump coming back 
is that he, as a matter of fact, will uh, operate by executive decree. Uh, he'll impose laws uh, and, and rule by decree. Is that exactly what's happening in Argentina? Yes, actually, I mean, there has been challenges against uh, uh, Millet in court. Uh, you know, I, I nor anybody should trust the courts. But, you know, what people want to do that, I mean, this the effectiveness or, you know, the, uh, of these decrees, will, the result will be taken uh, by the working class fighting in the streets. Uh, and ultimately probably changing the whole system, you know, the working class taking power. Uh, yes, I mean, uh, Trump in this country has said that uh, he uh, has the capacity that uh, through decrees, you know, uh, govern the country. And there are people on the left in the United States who don't really think that there was an insurrection or coup attempt and that we don't face the threat of fascism in the United States. You disagree? Of course I do, because, uh, I mean, we only have to remember 2019, uh, right here in the Bay Area where we live. I mean, uh, the right wing and the fascists came to uh, the most liberal city in the United States, Berkeley, and uh, they said that they were having a, a you know, a, an anti-communist uh, wave of protest, and pe people forget, but we were fighting the fascists for four days. And also in Sacramento, all these uh, right-wing and fascist groups were rallying, uh, and uh, they even assault and beat people, activists. And throughout the country, uh, a whole bunch, you know, all these organizations were parading with rifles, you know, were rallying with uh, weapons. Uh, they killed uh, those people in Charlottesville, uh, in Virginia. They, they killed, you know, the, the young lady. They had that march of Nazis openly saying that uh, they would not be replaced. I mean, uh, definitely the right-wing and fascist forces in this country, they felt uh, entitled, entitled by uh, the Trump administration. Nevertheless, we don't want to say that uh, the Democrats are not dangerous themselves against the working class because... Uh, they do allow these fascists uh, to run amok also. Uh, and uh, they do uh, attack the working class. The, if people remember, during Occupy, most of the cities, the, main, the big cities and the, or the main cities in the United States were ruled by Democratic mayors. And these people were the ones that arrested people, beating up people. So... Uh, uh, we got to be aware of the fascists and the Nazi gangs that are around, around particularly that support Trump, but also we ha should not have any faith on the Democratic Party. And, of course, the Vermont AFL-CIO passed a resolution uh, that there should be a general strike uh, of the working class if there was an attempted coup and insurrection. Uh, that was, uh, they attempted to nullify that, uh, Richard Trumpka, former head of the AFL-CIO, threatened they would put them in trusteeship. Uh, they didn't want to have a debate. And today, the union leadership uh, are against any kind of mobilization, national mobilization, against the rise of fascism. Uh, you think they're afraid of it getting out of control if workers start to organize against fascism in this country? Without a doubt. And unfortunately, uh, sometimes in history, uh, people don't see the signs. I mean, uh, people don't read history. Uh, uh, in Germany, uh, people underestimated the Nazis well, before Hitler came to power. And, uh, you know, he, when he came into uh, office in 1933, uh, still were other parties in parliament. Actually, one fact that people don't know is that Hitler never got rid of the Weimar Republic constitution. He was able to rule by emergency decrees. And, uh, you know, everybody knows that he blamed the communists for a fire and through an emergency decree, he, uh, you know, uh, was able to uh, get everybody else uh, out of parliament and, uh, you know, arrested people. And uh, that is a fact. People can, you know, uh, <laughs> take a look at that through literature, even put by the German parliament these days. They, they make a history. You can find it on the Internet, how the Weimar uh, Constitution was used by Hitler, you know? The person that uh, named uh, Hitler 
as Chancellor, President Hindenburg, he himself was not from the Nazi party. You know, he uh, named him because uh, the instability in Germany and the fear of workers' uh, revolution. So he chose the Nazi leader to be the Chancellor of Germany. So uh, those do not learn from history are doomed to repeat it.